Aubryon, it's, it's the history of Bordeaux. It was the first vineyard planted. That's to say, at the time of the Middle Ages, it was planted around a social organization that formed the town, because consumption was in the city, and transport was difficult with regards to wine. It was one of the first symbols, actually, of big wines, and which also, for that matter, meant that the wine from Bordeaux was significant in many places where it was sold in particular from the famous London tavern created by the owner of Chateau Aubryon at the time. The coast of Aubryon was so high that it was obvious it was part of, in fact, classified as wineries in 1865 and the first Rand winery. Aubryon has a property that is nearly 50 hectares, which produces a little bit of white wine unrecognized on four hectares, Aubryon White. Now the scoop is that we have no more vines of Aubryon White. It's over. This year's Mission Aubryon White. It has been changed by Robert de Luxembourg, the owner. This wine is very urban since we're really at the limit of the city of Bordeaux in its southern part on the appellation that is today pessac léogan which forms the northernmost part of the seriously historic appellation. Aubryon perhaps represents a sort of general summary of the Bordeaux vineyards. It is all at once sleek, full-bodied, fine, with really very subtle, elegant tannins and delicate, a very long aftertaste. There's a very assertive character which is smoked deep in the vineyard that appears after a few years of aging. Aubryon, I would say, brings everything we love in the vineyards of Bordeaux in different styles. It's a red wine that is made almost half from Cabernet Sauvignon, a large part Merlot, almost 40% Merlot, and then finished with Cabernet Franc and a little bit of Petit Verdot. This blend is a bit unusual for wines of this area and gives Aubryon a roundness perhaps a particular silkiness of choice tannins that are still extremely delicate. Aubryon is one of my best memories, 89 bottles, magnums. The opportunity to serve in the same dinner seven vintages of Aubryon. My regular diners at the Mission with Jean-Philippe Delmas and with his dad, who now directs Montrose, and sample incredible decanters. And white too, wonderful, like the 59 we tasted once, charged with notes of honey, outside the ordinary. Voilà, it's a wine that I had the opportunity to critique at the Pyramid in Vienna for the 50 years of Fernand Point, which was 1935. And in this period, Aubryon La Mission had very, very old vines that produced wines of intensity, always with a little hint of smoke, which made you think of wood ash. There are wines that we dream of, and then there are wines that we dream of but get to taste. This is the case with Aubryon. My fondest memory of Aubryon is 1929, which I tasted a dozen years ago, so the wine was already a serious and almost sacred age. And it kept this youthfulness, as if it were blind. We had all taken it for a wine which was maybe 50 years younger than what it actually was, which is, for the wine itself, an absolute compliment, because the wine was still wonderfully youthful almost a century later. The section of the chateau that you see on your left was built in the 16th century by Jean de Pontac in about the middle of the 1500s. It was at this time that uh, he created a, a wine estate as we know them today. But the history goes back much further uh, than the 16th century. In fact, there were vines planted here in our estates 
both at La Mission and at uh, Chateau Aubriand, going back to Roman times. It is no doubt in my mind that people always produced uh, wine in the parcels that surround uh, the chateaus here. As such, the Grave, and most particularly Chateau Aubriand, uh, is the birthplace of the great growths of Bordeaux. Aubriand, uh, as a name, was uh, really born and uh, uh, reached its uh, preeminence that it knows today thanks to the Pontac family. They were the first to attach a name of place to a wine. The Pontacs understood the notion uh, of brand early, if you will. Uh, so one could also say that Chateau Aubriand today is the oldest luxury brand in the world. Afterwards, uh, over the centuries, there have been three families attached to this estate, the Fumel family, the Lariu family, and now for 75 years, the Dillon family, which I represent uh, the fourth generation of the Dillon family. It was my great-grandfather, Clarence Dillon, who came here uh, to Chateau Aubriand first in 1934, uh, before acquiring the estate uh, in 1935. At the time, we were in a, uh, a great depression here in uh, France, but around the world. Uh, there was not much demand for the wines. Many of the great estates were for sale. He fell in love with uh, Chateau Aubriand, and it is thanks to that that uh, uh, four generations later or five generations later, uh, we are still here uh, today, um, staying true to uh, his vision and uh, his dream to uh, resuscitate uh, this great uh, growth to its uh, previous status and uh, to be able to reach year upon year the great potential of uh, quality that the, the Pontax uh, had already been able to lay in the foundations back in the 17th century. We're proud that now, uh, after three quarters of a century, we have joined the ranks of the great families that have been associated uh, to uh, the estate of uh, Chateau Aubriand and now Chateau La Mission Aubriand. So here we are, one of the ridges of Chateau Aubriand, and we have three ridges. One that is on this side of, which is on the side of the village of Pessac, and on the other side we have the village of Talence, which is primarily the rear of both the Aubriand Mission and Aubriand Tower. And then the last elevated area known as Berence Aubriand, which was the former estate that Aubriand bought again in the 18th century and is once again part of Pessac. And so the ground where we are now, it's kind of homogenous throughout the property, with a first layer that is rather sandy gravel, so a mixture of sand and gravel, and below a clay layer that is more or less deep. And so the mark of a great soil is when the vine can be regularly supplied with water, but never too much and never too little. So the goal of this soil, the so-called famous soil here in Bordeaux, well, is that the first layer will act like a drainage layer, and then the second layer will be used as a sponge, the idea being that during a heavy period of rain, the clay will absorb the water, and then in dry periods, like summer, the clay will release the water that has accumulated throughout the winter. For the reds, we use three varieties of Bordeaux, principally Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. The Médoc uses mainly Cabernet Sauvignon, here, where it's gravel and in the pessac lignon region, we use a bit of everything. Some Merlot, some Cabernet Sauvignon, and some Cabernet Franc. It allows us, without doubt, to attain a complexity a bit more expressive when we bring the three varieties together. So Merlot brings to the wine a strength and subtlety. It's a variety which creates wines that are generally very fruity, very aromatic. The Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon, they are more straightforward. We could say that they form the skeleton of the wine. It's the backbone of the wine. And the Merlot, we could say, dresses the wine. Voila, if we can classify it like that, so the blend of two is always more interesting than one single variety.
To come back to this notion of soil that we were talking about a moment ago, you must know that in the word terroir, soil, there is the word terre, earth, but this isn't enough. In the sense of a vineyard like here at Orbillon, you have to have a sense of the ecosystem, which is to say that effectively the ground, there's the planning of the vines, the layout that you're going to choose, the density of the plantation, the orientation of the plot, the microclimate, and then the climate in general. So here in Bordeaux, the climate background, let's say for everybody, will be an oceanic climate. And since we're still near the ocean, of course, I'd say a climate that brings us water regularly. And then here at Aubryon, given the special microclimate at Aubryon, for many centuries it has always been precocity, which is to say that here, for natural reasons, it's always a little warmer. And so we always have an earlier harvest than anywhere else in Bordeaux. Even in the 18th century, there's evidence of people who recorded the dates of their grape harvests. It was not uncommon to see that when the bank declared vintage, Aubryon had already finished its own. So it's really, it goes right back a very, as far as one can find it in the archives. They harvest plot to plot. A plot is a cultivation unit which is represented first by a particular soil, because even though I said earlier that the ground is roughly the same all over the property, we'd say that there's a difference in the first layer with regards to its depth. There's also the grape variety, which is different depending on the plots. The graft is the individual clone, so it all adds up to each plot a small entity, a small vineyard of its own, and must be treated individually. We taste the grapes regularly of all the plots until the date of the harvest, so every day or every two days. It's a bit tedious, but in a vintage year like this, it's simply joy. So here, it is mainly for research in the selection of vines. So just to reassure everyone, there is no genetic manipulation. We are not at that level. Rather, directly at the selection of plants, we select the best vines, which means the vines that are best adapted to our ecosystem, our land. So it's a fairly intensive research. You should know that during vintage, there are about 20 people working on this project here. It consists of selecting from within our vineyards, our library to us, the plans for vineyards, and setting them aside to follow them year after year, vintage after vintage, to see how they behave depending on weather conditions. Outside this research in terms of vineyards, the laboratory helps us to effectively monitor the maturity of all the grapes, all the vineyards, before vintage, to know when we will harvest. It permits us also to follow the qualitative side, the qualitative monitoring during winemaking, during aging in barrels for bottling in order to control every step of the wine, quality wine and be sure not to have any problems during the aging process. The grapes are brought back here to be turned into wine in these tanks, after the winemaking according to two fermentation processes, alcoholic and malolactic. We'll do the blending, which is of course to create the best possible blend for Aubryon's fine wine. So you must imagine it's a bit like creating a perfume. We have samples of different tanks in front of us. In each tank we've selected plots. So the tanks represent one or two plots of one grape variety. So it's all Merlot or all Cabernet Sauvignon of the same quality. Because historically we know whether or not a particular plot generally produces great wines or not. So the aim of the game is to take a selection which is diverse and varied. All these elements in order to have the best possible blend. To give you an idea, this year it was up to 22 forms, up to 22 different tastes, before finding the correct blend. So similarly, after a level of quality, we can make an inferior second wine. So everything that has been used for the great wine is put aside. All that's left we make a second wine with, a second taste, which here is called Bains Aubryon and since 2007 Clarence Aubryon. And then a third part goes out in bulk according to negotiation. Thank you. 
Ici, nous sommes dans la tonnerie. Here we are in the cooperage. The person who works here makes about five barrels per day on average. It uses French oak, which is mainly from forests in central France. Oaks called haute futé, which are relatively old and fairly straight with a fine wood grain. You know that when you put the wine in barrels, some of the tannins which are in the wood will migrate into the wine and then will participate in the construction of wine. So we try to have the tannins mirror our wines. Those which are fine grains so have fine tannins, which contribute to wine and do not dominate the wine. When we're going to draw the barrel up, we'll toast the inside of it, which is to say we'll burn the wood a little inside. So we can more or less burn, according to the wish of each winemaker, knowing that the more we burn or toast the barrel, the more we'll have these notes of toasted bread, which is very pleasant, a vanilla, found in certain wines, because some wines seek it out. The desire is to have the woods and its aromas infused in the wine, but not to dominate. It's all about balance. So there you have it. That's what we're looking for here at Aubryon. It's quite rare in Bordeaux, and even in the world, to have a cooperage still remain in a castle. We are here in the first year wine cellar of Chateau Aubryon, and in front of you all of the last harvest. Fine wines and secondary wines, all oaked, renewed annually for a period that varies depending on the vintage, between 18 to 24 months. Knowing that variations in the aging period of the wine in the barrels accordingly alters the quality of the vintage year. We can equally vary the percentage of what we term a new barrel. Which is to say that normally in a great vintage year it's 100% new oak and then in the vintages of lesser concentration we will use only 60, 70, 80% new barrels and the remainder will be barrels that were already used the previous year. The process of barrel aging consists of two essential things for wine. On one hand, to oxygenate the wine to mellow the tannins, because oxygen combines with the tannins, it softens, sweetens or tones down the wine, in a sense polish it. And then the second thing that is important is the clarification of the wine. That is to say, a deposit will form in the bottom of the barrel by simple precipitation, and every three months we have to do the famous racking. That's to say, we'll remove the juice, the clear wine, any deposits which have formed at the bottom of the barrel. So by doing this operation every three months, after 18 or 24 months, we have a wine that is perfectly clear, perfectly unclouded. There's about 700 barrels of fine wines, and nearly the same amount of secondary wines. So we have about, depending on the vintage year, because of course the output depends on the weather, but we have between 1,500 barrels in the cellar here. We are here in the underground cellar of Chateau Aubryon, which is where what we call La Réserve Chateau, all the vintage years that are kept here, which are no longer for sale, that are served in the event of dinners, meals on site here at the castle, or outside, abroad or in France, when doing special events. So we have this library where we have the oldest vintage, which is 1848. One special feature here at Aubryon is that we use a special bottle shape, it's what Monsieur Dillon wishes, in order to stand out from the production Bordeaux vintage 58, 1858 inclusive. So here is a magnum, but the bottle is identical. This particular form has shoulders which are broader than the rest of the bottle, with a sticker identifying the wine, so that the bottle is always recognizable. And I must say that today it serves us well with regards to the many problems of counterfeiting, because today the price of wine makes sure that unfortunately they attract the greed of some quite dishonest people who try to make fakes for resale, particularly at auctions.
ici à Aubryon, at Aubryon, we have a specialty for red wines equally, or at least to have equally in the vineyard 45% of Merlot, 45% of Cabernet Sauvignon, and 10% of Cabernet Franc. This allows us to better follow the vintage year. From time to time there are vintages where we say mostly Merlot, they are usually early vintages where the Merlot is going to be more successful, and some which are rather more Cabernet vintages instead, which tend to be late vintages, where success is rather Médoc. So we were so lucky that Aubryon can use both varieties, and this is probably one reason why Aubryon is considered by professionals and some amateurs like the vineyard with the most consistent level of quality in Bordeaux. Whatever the vintage, whatever the weather. Here at Chateau Aubryon, its last vintage, it has a color that is relatively deep. That is to say, we have a crimson. It's necessary to know that when the wines are young, we get to a red that is rather pulling more towards the violet. And the more the wine evolves, the more the red will turn to orangey, to have almost what is called brick red for very old wines. There are several fragrances that jump out. On the one hand, on the fruit side, we find practically a range of red fruit aromas. Whether that be blackberry, currant, and then on the aromatic range that is more, let's say more earthy, a kind of like inside a cigar box. That is to say, you open the cigar box, you have this mix of aromas, cedar wood with tan, Yes, there's one thing that comes to mind. It's that when you walk into it, a coffee roaster, it's the notion of roasted coffee beans, voila. You have those smells there. In the mouth, another characteristic of fine wines, and Aubryon in particular, is to have both the density and softness, a sweetness. That's to say a lot of tannin, a lot of concentration in the wine. But we feel like it's the tannins that are placed in velvet gloves. have to make a perfect wine every year. And I would say that the last 10 years uh, we have shown uh, probably, the, not probably, definitely, uh, the strongest um, 10 vintages in terms of quality for our great wines uh, that have ever emanated from our estates. The only mission that Prince Obel gave me, which is the same as his mother and his grandfather gave to my father and my grandfather, make the best wine possible. So here I've just opened the, uh, the guest book uh, dating back uh, from uh, 1935. We're conscious that Aubryon will survive each individual. It's a myth uh, that uh, transpires generations and uh, centuries. And I have no doubt uh, that uh, it'll take many of these books uh, to fill uh, still uh, in uh, the centuries to come of, uh, of uh, visits to the to Chateau Aubriand or Chateau La Mission Aubriand. Here is one of our premier crew, the Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, classified in 1855. Lafitte Rothschild is part of a wine-growing appellation of Poyac. It's one of the treasures of the Poyac appellation. Lafitte has always been characterized by a certain elegance. It's very distinguished with a hint of underlying character. 
Lafitte, Lafitte is one of the oldest wines in the history of Bordeaux. We're talking about wines from the 18th century. It's a very elegant property, well established. The chateau is magnificent, looking out over a water feature which appears to have been there since forever, which gives it a sort of reassuring feel. They say that for a wine to mature, it has to see water. Here we have this water feature, and the Gironde estuary is not far away. So the conditions here in the northern part of the Appalachian are pretty well ideal. The Lafitte is a wine that's all about elegance. It needs time. Tasting a young Lafitte can be quite a frustrating experience, because you don't yet have the full expression of the soils, the mineral notes. The wine can come across as a bit reserved. A little bit like its creator, for that matter. Eric de Rothschild is a man who you have to get to know well before you discover his true nature. The same is true for his wine. It's a really robust wine, a majority of Cabernet Sauvignon, like the Latour, almost 75 to 80 percent. The smoothness of the Merlot and the density of some of the Cabernet Franc vintages give the wine a really nice length. 47, 61, and even 1899, made just before the start of the 20th century, is nonetheless still very drinkable today. The Lafitte domain has existed since the 12th century. Was there a vineyard here at that time? Maybe a few vines. We don't really know. But there was a large property, an estate which covered roughly half of the Médoc. The wine growing at Château Lafitte started closer to 1620 or 25, something like that. That's when we start seeing real evidence of wine production on the estate. And the Château Lafitte wines start to make a name for themselves. After that, there were various different owners, one of whom was very famous, the Ségur family, specifically Alexandre de Ségur, or the Prince of the Vines, as he was known at the time. He was someone who spent a great deal of time looking into the qualitative aspect of things. In fact, the Ségur family owned a number of locations that were later developed into chateaux. They owned Lafitte, Mouton, probably La Tour, basically a majority of the land around Poyac, saint Estef, etc. Then, with time, well, there were successions, legacies, there were a few unfortunate decisions made, and the estate was gradually divided up. And that's how the different chateaux that I mentioned, plus quite a few others, came to be established. After that, there were various different owners, things evolved and changed. The changes weren't that frequent, but there were nonetheless quite a few. And then the Rothschild family arrived, the French branch of the Rothschilds, on the initiative of Baron James, who bought Lafitte in 1860. The estate currently belongs to Baron Eric de Rothschild, who manages all of the wine-growing estates of the family. He represents the sixth generation of family members living on and managing the estate in person. As for the evolution of Lafitte and of the other properties, some things have changed, most obviously in terms of the technical aspects of the winemaking process, the vine culture, the choice of grape varieties, etc. All of those are things which evolve. But there's one thing which doesn't change, the fundamental staple of the estate, by which I refer to the quality of the soil. The land is unchanging. It remains today just as it was when our ancestors left it to us. And this is obviously how it should be left for our successors. So geographically speaking, we are 50 kilometers northwest of Bordeaux, following the route of the Garonne and then the Gironde. 
We are in the commune of Poillac. Château Lafitte is actually on the right bank of the Gironde estuary. Behind me, you can see the château and its farm buildings. The farm buildings are obviously the technical buildings, the fermenting rooms, the storehouses, and the barns for the tractors and the machines. And the whole front part here is the vineyard. It's a solid block of about 110 hectares, and it all belongs to one tenant. When you look at a map of the vineyards, you can see very clearly that as a whole, the vines occupy one relatively narrow stretch of land along the left bank of the river Garonne. This is because over many years the geology of this stretch of land has evolved, building up layers of different soils, creating the estates that we know today. In general, the classified crews are grown closer to the river because apart from the quality of land that is built up here, the river also affects the climate. The water flow helps to maintain relatively mild temperatures, especially in the springtime, which helps the vines to grow healthily. In terms of the local climate, we have a relatively high rainfall in the Poyak Appalachian, but the rainfall is quite predictable. Generally, there are not showers every day, but when the rain comes, it is quite heavy, but it comes in relatively short bursts. This means that the vines have access to good reserves of water at the start of their growth, but that later, we generally have a nice summer here, the conditions for ripening are perfect for producing great quality wine. By this I mean that the vines are forced to work a little harder to obtain the water they need. The harvests at Lafitte are done entirely by hand. The crucial thing is to bring in the grape when it's perfectly ripe, or at least when we consider it to be perfectly ripe. The vineyard is large. We have just over 110 hectares, so obviously, if we want the grapes to be harvested when they're ripe, especially given the precision we demand, the process has to happen fast. We employ a large number of people. We need a team of roughly 350 to 380 grape pickers to harvest the entire property. The harvest will last more or less two weeks, but sometimes those two weeks can be extended to three. Basically, it depends on the different grape varieties, the different soils, the climate. It can happen that we harvest some plots, then stop, then carry on with others, then stop again, just to ensure that we get each grape when it is perfectly ripe. Here at Lafitte, we don't harvest the grapes into trays. We load them directly into small-sized bins. This is because we feel that the most important factor for the harvest is speed. The fact is that when we feel the grapes in one plot are ripe, we try to get them in as fast as possible, to cut them as quickly as possible and to bring them into the fermentation vats as quickly as possible, so that we are sure that they are being properly treated, that they are protected from any possible damage. The bins have a relatively low capacity, obviously, which helps to prevent the grapes from being squashed together. Also, the bins are equipped with a number of different shelves so that the grapes can be sorted directly as they come off the vines. The temporary workers harvest the grapes, but when it comes to the sorting tables, it's our full-time staff, those who are with us all year round, who sort the grape bunches. They will get rid of grapes which are deficient in any way, grapes that are not fully ripe or overripe, will be removed as quickly as possible. Roughly speaking, the time from the moment when a bunch of grapes is cut until it arrives in the vats is no more than an hour. This is one of our markers of quality. Once the grapes have been collected from the vines, the grapes come to us here. Quite simply, we separate the grapes from the stems, the leaves, or any vegetable matter. 
After that, we transfer the grapes, either into wooden vats, like the ones you can see here, or into inox vats, depending on which plots the grapes come from. We can use the wooden vats for our best plots. This is not only because they're made of wood, but also because we have a large variety of different sizes. From a practical point of view, this enables us to keep grapes from the different plots separate during the fermentation process. As you know, the Bordeaux wines are blended wines. And this system means that when it comes to blending, we have a large number of distinct lots, and we can make a really fine blend. In terms of the winemaking process itself, we're very traditional. We're not big interventionists. During the alcoholic fermentation process, we pump the barrels over twice a day. We stop working the wine at a relatively early stage in order to let the extraction of the tannins and the colors happen naturally as a result of the contact between the wine and the solids. Depending on the quality of the plots, the maceration process can take anywhere between 15 to 30 days. All the decisions about how we will use the various different lots are made after the end of the malolactic fermentation. This refers to the second fermentation period during the winemaking process. Once the malolactic fermentation is finished, then we take the wine down into the barrels. This is the storage park for the wood, which is piled up at Clairbois by the distributors. We keep it here for about 20 months, and then we take it and move it to the hangar so that the wood stays dry, even in bad weather. After about 24 months, we start sorting it by width. The categories we use are thin staves of 6 to 8, medium of 8 to 10, and the larger ones of 10 to 12. Once it's been sorted by width, we can start to machine finish the lumber in the factory. For this, the first step is to cut them to size. We cut each of the staves to the required dimensions. For the Bordelais barrels, we cut them down to 96. After that, the next stage is to do the steam bending. This means that we pass the staves through a machine which shapes the wood, giving it a gentle curve. The next stage is to do the jointing. In the workshop, we have a joint machine which carves the edges so that the extremities are thinner than the middle, in order to give the barrel its rounded shape and the angle of the joint. Once this is done, the staves are ready to be assembled into the drum. That's the size of a barrel laid out flat. We lay out wood to make a width of 2.18 meters. When making a barrel, you know, depending on the width of the wood, how many wide, medium and thin staves you will need. We use this machine here to do the trimming. This involves molding this part, which we call the pen, the comb, and the crows. This groove here is made to receive the head of the barrel. That is a head. The center is marked out so that it can be lined up on the machine. The machine will cut a circle, which can then be fixed into the barrel. As I said earlier, the head is inserted into the groove known as the crows. Inside the crows we use a glue made of flour and water because the crows is rectangular, while the head is a triangle. So to make up for the lack of wood, we use wheat flour.
Once the head is installed, we sand the barrel. After that, we use this machine, which is called a winch, to tighten the hoops and adjust the height. In Bordeaux, we traditionally finish them with four wooden hoops. We work as a group of five people and we make about 2,200 barrels a year, exclusively for the estates of the Baron de Rothschild, including Chateau Lafitte, Chateau de Armillon, Rio Sec in Sauterne, the Evangile in Pomerol, as well as Los Vascos in Chile, and Bodega Caro in Argentina. The oak comes exclusively from the center of France. The primary location is Allier, and the rest comes from areas nearby, the Cher and the Nièvre. What is special about the Allier oak is that it has a very fine grain which gives it a strong vanilla essence, and the longer it is toasted, the more powerful the tannins extracted in the barrel. Here we are in what is known as the first year cellar. At the end of the malolactic fermentation, we bring the bottles down here in the barrels. The first and second wines age for 18 months in the barrels. During this time, we rack the barrels every three months. The racking helps us to clarify the wine. It's a totally natural process by which the weight of the sediment and the solid matter makes it sink to the bottom of the barrel. So every three months we rack the barrels to get what we call the clear wine. The leaves are not thrown away because depending on the vintage and depending on the period, it can represent a significant portion of the barrel. So the leaves are conserved separately, filtered, and if the quality is reasonable, it can be reincorporated into the wine from which it was taken, be it the premium wine or the second wine. If the quality is considered too poor, it's eliminated. Now we're going to check how the lot which we have in this barrel is behaving. It's a lot which was barreled a while ago, so we're going to taste it to see how it has evolved. This lot was barreled, as I said, a while ago, so you can start to taste the first hints of the woody aromas. But the most important thing is to check that there's nothing abnormal, that the aging is going smoothly, which fortunately seems to be the case here. After this, at the end of the aging in the barrels, which takes 18 months, the wine undergoes one final operation known as the fining. The fining again helps to clarify the wine, but also to soften it. It's a reaction which takes place among the external proteins. Like most of the Grand Chateau, we use the traditional method, which involves adding egg whites, which react with the tannins in the wine, forming molecules which are sufficiently heavy to sink to the bottom of the barrel. The fining is done barrel by barrel. Generally, we buy about 10,000 eggs per year. We separate out the egg yolks by hand because we only use the whites. It's added to the barrels. We wait for between 45 and 55 days for the contact to occur between the 
albumin of the egg and the wine. After that, the wine is racked for the last time. The wine is then almost ready to be bottled. We do one last microbiological analysis to see if it still contains any yeast or harmful bacteria. And then the wine is bottled. Generally, there's about a two-year time frame between harvest and the end of aging. So here we are for the final test, shall we say. We have a Chateau Lafitte 1995, which is made, if I remember rightly, of a majority of Cabernet Sauvignon, somewhere in the region of 83%, if my memory serves me. It must have about 12% Merlot, and the rest is Cabernet Franc. So when we're looking at a Lafitte, what we're most interested in is it's really the brightness and the color of the wine. It has these deep red tints, garnet red, very interesting. As for the nose of it, it's true that we have certain... It's difficult to really give an idea with an image and a microphone. But I have to say that for me, the olfactive aspect is very important because you should be able to notice the primary aromas of the wine when it's young. As for an older wine, it's the secondary aromas which come through, more varied, complex and subtle. What you get is a combination of all of these aromas, and they come together to produce combinations, floral images, or fruity, or a wealth of other associations, depending on the palate of each individual. You can sense that real, full-bodied character. The first impression when it enters the mouth, the initial attack. You might say it's relatively silky, not too brutal. It's a wine with quite strong tannins, but they shouldn't have an aggressive tone. It should have a softer edge. This is one of the reasons why these wines benefit from being left to age. As a rule, a Lafitte should sit for a minimum of 10 years before being brought to the table and opened by the consumer. In order for the different grape varieties to blend well, for the composition of the tannins, the acid and the alcohol to come together in the most harmonious way possible, you have to leave time for the wine to develop, to reach its optimum harmony and fullness. Only then, when you come to sip the wine and to swallow it, can you discover that fabulous sensation as it passes through your throat, because it has developed a lovely soft silkiness. It's lovely. If you taste the wine by itself, it's obviously wonderful. But it's true that our wines are meant to be served with a meal, so to get maximum pleasure out of the experience, best serve them alongside a good steak à la Baudelaise or a delicious rack of lamb from Payac.